I'm Diana, and I love printing and design, typography and branding, books and publishing. I've traveled the world learning about trends to share with my students and with my readers. But I haven't forgotten where I started, writing papers about paper on paper. And now, I've created a podcast to share what I know with you. So, let's talk paper scissors. I was first introduced to the work of Charles Nix, type director at Monotype, years ago through a LinkedIn learning course he created about learning type design. This series of videos has become an incredible resource that I've leaned on when teaching my typography class. Charles has been a co-instructor of sorts in my advanced typography class this semester, as I've handled the high-level big picture ideas moving the type industry forward. While I've invited students to watch Charles's video series to learn about the nitty gritty details to design their own original typefaces. I recently attended a webinar hosted by the Association of Registered Graphic Designers, featuring Charles Nix, chatting all about the possibilities of variable type and why it has the potential to change how we interact with and design fonts. I was thoroughly captivated and I reached out to Charles after to see if he may speak to our little itty bitty class. I was delighted when he enthusiastically agreed and in early April, 2022, he imparted his variable type wisdom in our class. Typography student, Nate Evangelista, expressed interest in co-hosting our guest and he did an incredible job helping to ask insightful questions after Charles's talk. Nate, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Diana. Hey, everybody. My name's Nate. I'm a graphic layout artist at TC Transcontinental and a proud GCM alumnus. I went from leaving nursing because of human anatomy to being completely obsessed with type anatomy. I had the utmost pleasure of being a student in Diana's advanced typography class in my final semester and found myself enjoying the experience of creating my own typeface from scratch. I owe it to both Diana and the tutelage of one Charles Nix. His LinkedIn learning course on type design gave me the proper insight and knowledge on how to complete this project and allowed me to create a typeface I am truly proud of. Aside from that, Charles shared invaluable knowledge about the world of type, particularly his point that type designers and graphic designers as a whole are the intersection between art and engineering. What we do isn't only about making something that's trendy or attention grabbing. We are also advocates of accessibility, ensuring the work we create isn't only enjoyed by many, but also helps to improve user experience and interaction. This is where emerging trends such as variable font technology have become so prevalent in today's modern world, as it gives us designers the opportunity to create content that is accessible and inclusive alongside being artistic and visually stimulating. In the following talk, you'll hear some incredible examples of variable type that exists in the world. You'll hear about the possibilities for both the digital and physical world, and the creative solutions possible when designers can really play and experiment with type as a medium. Variable font technology allows us to move beyond the binary to a space that's fluid and dimensional and allows us to explore a spectrum of type. There are some visuals of concepts discussed because this of course is a visual topic. These are provided in the show notes at talkpaperscissors.info. Charles, over to you. Thank you. Um, I consider this a great a great privilege to get to speak to you guys. Um, and I think you'll, I hope, hopefully you'll feel that by the end of our time together. Um, but yeah, it's an important part of um, what I've done my entire career working with students um, and what I do now at Monotype and I'll sort of unpack what all of that means. Um, I, I went to school here in New York City um, and uh, studied typography and design and fine art at the Cooper Union. Um, and then shortly after that um, incorrigible young person that I was, I started teaching typography um, very soon after at the Parsons School of Design, where I taught for, for two decades um, and eventually sort of retired as chair of the 
communication design department. Pre-tired, I would say, because I I went to work in publishing. Um, I had been working in publishing for a couple of uh, decades <laughs> prior. Um, I'm, I'm I started when I was really young. Um, I'm kind of old now, but um, but just so you can sort of square the circle of how I spent decades doing each of these things. Um, from, from publishing, I went to work at Monotype, where I started as a type designer. Um, I had been designing type since the early 90s um, and actually designed pre-digital in my work at Cooper Union. Right now, I am a creative type director at Monotype, and that means that I design type, so I work with brands and with... Um, with our uh, in-house foundry to create type for the library of fonts that exist at Monotype, which is the largest collection of type in the history of the world. It's all been aiming at this moment. Um, and I create type for brands too. So um, you may have seen the, the latest uh, incarnation of the M&M's brand with its new type base. That's something I designed. Um, and the the Helvetica Now and Helvetica Now variable types for um, for Monotype and the Monotype library are both in part my work too. I mean, none of it's one individual's work. It takes great numbers of people to put typefaces out into the world. Um, but that's what I do now. So um, uh, part of what... Um, Part of what I am tasked with as, as a creative type director is, is talking to people about what's going on in, in our studio and the things we're really excited about. And one of those things is variable type. Um, I will, I'm going to launch the presentation now. And um, I've left plenty of time at the end of this so that we can, um, we can talk, have Q&A. Um, but I'm going to sort of throw you into the deep end and describe to you what variable fonts are and um, and what we're doing with them. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll come back together. So one second, I'm going to share screen. And if, this is sort of a dark side of the moon moment, you know, where you're, um, I lose communication. I can't see in, if anyone's still here. Um, so if at any point you want to interrupt me, you should feel absolutely free. Um, just ask a ask a question out loud. I'm happy to respond. It won't throw me off my game too much. So yeah, like I said, I'm part of the one of the largest studios of type in the world, and also um, a team of 50 plus individuals who sit on top of one of the largest libraries of type in the history of the world. Well, it's the largest library of type in the history of the world. There are 50 of us in the in the monotype studio but we're 50 people inside of a much larger organization um so monotype is gigantic and worldwide but the studio that's tasked with sort of caring for the library and working with um with customers is um 50 individuals and then of those 50 about a dozen of us are actually type designers um and a goodly number of us are creative type directors too so i'm not the only one um there are type directors in, in Asia, uh, in Europe, and in the U.S. Um, we, like I said, are sort of spread all over the planet, so we take on a lot of crazy large projects um, in every script known to man, living and dead. <laughs> um, in, in fact, you're probably familiar with the Nodo project that we worked on, which is, um, you know, Google and Monotype's attempt to create a family of typefaces that covers every language on the planet, living and dead. Um, and I worked on a good part of that, too. Um, but my part in it was really small compared to the overall plan. But, um, yeah, let's take a look at some of the technologies that that monotype is actually brought to bring to market. So in addition to creating typefaces, we have a, a team of engineers who create, um, create type technology like Spark um, that allow type to exist in places that you wouldn't expect it to exist, like wearable technology or the internet of things, or as you're seeing here, yeah, the, it's, uh, the Spark technology is this sort of um, the subsetting and compression software that allows really complex scripts to exist in really small spaces, um, which is really cool. So um, not only do we make type, but we make type beautiful wherever it exists. 
And one other thing that you may be familiar with is this What the Font app, um, which is part of the What the Font community, which is part of my fonts. Um, if you don't have this app, you should get it. It's hilarious. It's free. Um, and essentially, yeah, become your next favorite party trick to take pictures of type and to identify it using the, the corpus of fonts at my fonts. Um, here's a picture of me using it. <laughs> you select the type and it takes you to all of the possible matches and then you can, yeah, go right there. Anyway, it's, um, it's something I use all the time to help our customers identify type. So it's one of my sort of tricks. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about is this, which is variable. Um, it's something that that at monotype we're super excited about because you know changes in format don't come around that often um especially ones as exciting as this um so it's actually called open type variable or open type variations fonts but um it's referred to commonly as variable fonts um and i'm i'm fairly certain that this period in typographic history will be remarkable to future historians for um, for this technology, for the way that it um, that it lays bare the sort of spectrum of possibilities within a type family. Um, but let me ex spell out exactly what it, what it is. So first of all, um, it's one font file. That's the that's the sort of um, root part of it. Um, instead of 60 font files, um, for all the different members of a font family, you get one font file, um, or sometimes two. I'll explain that two part um, in a second. But yeah, one font file that contains all the font styles in a font. Um, so this is a typeface called Macklin Sans, which was designed by Malou Verlome, who used to be a studio mate of mine, um, has since gone off on his own. Um, but it's part of a super family of type design. So that's a family that, um, for whatever reason, is beyond what um, you would normally find in a family. So a family of types would be, you know, something like a sans serif family like Helvetica. Um, but a super family in this case has both sans and serif um, and a bunch of other sort of bells and whistles thrown in. But in this Macklin super family, there are 58 distinct styles. Um, both serif and sans serif. So the sans alone has nine basic weights and they run from this hairline here on the left to the black on the right. So in the Macklin sans variable font, you get all of those nine weights of Macklin sans plus 841 other fonts because there are 850 points along the spectrum from hairline to, um, to black. And you can choose any one of those um, weights along the, along the line. Um, now, I don't know where you are in your typographic journey, <laughs> but you probably don't need 850 options for weight. Um, you maybe only need one or two, and they're probably ones that already exist. Um, and I agree with you, there's probably enough type in the world already. So why 850 options? Um, the basic font menu for these typefaces, these variable fonts remains pretty much exactly the same as you would get in all of those static instances. So um, if you want just the regular, you can choose the regular from the font menu. But in those instances um, where you want to have something that is slightly heavier than um, the heavyweight for a, for a headline or slightly lighter for something like a caption, um, you can use all of those. Well, you can fine tune the variations yourself without having to contact Malou and ask him to create a custom weight for you which may sound like a throwaway line, but, but prior to um, prior to joining Monotype, um, I, you know, I designed a lot of books, hundreds of books. Um, and occasionally I would find myself setting a caption in really small type and realize that the, that the typeface wasn't up for it. It needed to be slightly heavier. So um, I would call up the person who designed the typeface um, and ask them if they could create a special weight of it for me, which often they would because typefaces are designed by human beings. But you can do that yourself with a variable font. You can create that special weight. Um, or <clears throat> this is a super, not a super family, but a very large family called Univer, which you're probably familiar with. Um, this is the Univer Next family, and it's got 59 individual font files. Um, 
but if you wanted to use it on a website, um, it would probably <laughs> cause a lot of sort of choking and uh, on download times because it's a lot to ask of a server to dish up all these fonts. Um, or if you're just tired of chasing down 60 font files, um, then the one font file aspect of, of variable is probably really helpful. In the Univer Next uh, variable family, it consists of two files. One's italic and the other one is upright. Um, and they contain all of those 69 styles um, from extra black to light condensed, from extended to, um, to compressed. Um, and they're all there. Uh, all the regular styles are still there in the font menu but you don't have to track 59 individual font files in their place there's the genetic code for 33,000 uh combinations between all of the um the axes within this font and i'll describe what axes are in just a second um and of course the sort of magic trick of it is that despite the fact that you have more possibilities of weight and width um you get it all in a smaller file size than the individual font files, which is crazy. Um, this is Avenir Next, which is also an Adrian Fertiger design. Um, and in its traditional format, it contained dozens of font files. Um, and it moved from ultra light condensed through, uh, through the regular in the middle onto the heavy. But in the variable version, all of those styles are still there in the font menu, but there are now 16,250 shades of weight and width between. So it's a crazy workhorse of a typeface in a really tiny package. So weight and width, those are the two um, typeface variations that I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, compressed and condensed, extended, um, light and black and everything in between. Um, and those are two of the fundamental variables in the variable font format. So we refer to these variables as axes. Um, an individual axis is is one like weight, which goes from ultra light to um, to black, and another axis would be the um, the variable axis for for width. So um, weight, of course, we use to establish hierarchies and emphasis. It's pretty much how sans serifs do their job. Width is more like a convenience, um, sort of an economic choice, uh, fitting larger type into a smaller space by reducing the width. But now imagine instead of having to move from a regular to a condensed or from a condensed to a compressed, you could just um, reduce the width by tiny steps, not all the way to a condensed, but just a scant amount so um, that the type would fit. And it would do it without distorting the type, which we're all sort of used to seeing from art artificial compressions. Um, the width variable and, and variable type makes that possible. Um, some of us, <laughs> me and a, a few other people still use italics. Um, there have been, you may have, have read some articles in the design press in the past few years about the death of italics, but they still exist and they still have a semantic use. Um, in serif typefaces, usually a type is either italic or it's not. So the one on the top, which is Wallbaum, um, which I designed in 20, I don't know, 2017, I think, 2016. Um, it's Wallbaum Roman on the left and Wallbaum italic on the right. So it's sort of an either or situation. But there are some variable fonts um, that have uh, a slant instead of an italic. So you can choose the degree to which the letter forms slant. Um, so those are two other variables. One is italics, which is a sort of on-off switch. And the other one is slant, which allows you to control the amount of slant, including some typefaces that have a, a back slant in their slant axis. Um, and variable fonts can also change depending on the size at which they're used. So this is all, all of these ends here are the regular weight of Wallbaum. But on the left-hand side is the six-point version, and on the right is the 96-point version. Um, and in the middle is, a, I think that's the 14-point version, and then there's a 10-point version, and then there's a 30-point ver version on the second to the right. And they're sort of um, reduced to scale or enlarged to scale down at the bottom. So different drawings for different sizes of type. Um, 
In type design and in graphic design, we refer to this as optical sizing, which is specific designs for specific sizes. Um, I am really, I, I'm, I consider this probably one of the most important things about variable, but you know, I'm, I'm alone in that. I'm not completely alone, but um, to a lot of people, this idea of changing typefaces based on size is, is a sort of theoretical or a philosophical exercise, but it is one of the hallmarks of great typography, because if you use good optical sizing, if, if it exists, um, it can really improve legibility at really small sizes and allow the type at the larger sizes to look really beautiful, to be ready for its close up. Um, so that's the last of the five basic variables in variable fonts. So if you're keeping track, <laughs> the five variables are weight, which uh, controls the sort of the, the heavier lightness of a, of a font. There's width, which controls the, obviously the width of the font. There's italic and slant, yeah, the two separate variables, just because slant is slightly different, as I explained. And the last one is optical size, which is great. All of that's great. Um, and if that was the sort of extent of variable fonts, that would be quite a bit. Um, but there's there's more. There is a sixth variable. Um, and I'm sorry for whatevs, but um, variable type designers are free to make up as many variable axes as they want, which is crazy. I think there's an upward limit of 64,000 variables that are um, able to be put into a font and they're custom. So they can be whatever we want them to be. Um, so it's led some designers, type designers who are normally a very reserved bunch of people um, to create some really cool experiments. So I'll show you a few of those. This is one that's relatively tame. Um, this is Illicit Script by um, Laura Worthington, who is amazing. Um, and a former studio mate of mine, Jim Wasco, and they worked on this together for a couple of years. It has two axes. Um, it has a familiar weight axis, which allows it to go from this thin to a slightly thicker, but it also has this sort of um, formal to casual axis, which reduces the contrast between the thick and thin in, in the typeface. So on one end, it looks like it's drawn with a Sharpie marker, very expertly, of course. And on the other end, it looks like it was drawn with a flexible nib. So it can go from very casual looking to very formal looking. And there are 76,500 variations between those two um, variable axes. Um, this is FS Kitty, which is from Fontsmith, now part of Monotype. Um, and it has two axes also. There's one for the amount of shadow on the letters. And there's also one for the weight of the outlines around the letters. And of course, animated, it looks particularly cool. Um, but yeah, shadow and, and um, outline weight, two custom axes. This is a, um, an experiment from Promfam Suksumek. Um, and it is a variable that has not a range of weight or width, but a range of emotions. So <laughs> it's experimental, as I said, it goes from very negative emotions, which you just saw, to very positive emotions. And so I've animated between the two so you can sort of see what happens as you move from one end of the emotional roller coaster to the other. Um, this is Pimlico, uh, also by Fontsmith. And this has a variable for the amount of shine or reflection on the letters. So it can go from this really shiny gleaming state to something that's super shiny, like melted chocolate. Um, and yeah, it's a custom variable for shine. <laughs> Again, not something that's going to be in every typeface, but it's particularly cool in this one. Um, and this is not a, a variable font about letters. This one is um, a variable font created by my studio mate, uh, Friedrich Althausen. It's a single character, um, but it has three. Does it have three variables? Um, I think it does. Yeah, so it's a one glyph font, so it only has one character in it. Um, and it shows the effect of um, COVID lockdown. So his hair grows, um, his beard grows, uh, he gets bags under his eyes. So those are three different things. The bags under his eyes are sort of from homeschooling. And then his ears got distended from wearing a mask to the supermarket. So there are variables to control each of those things separately. Um, it was a very relatable font just a couple of years ago. 
So that's the groundwork. There's one font file and it contain, contains all the variables. Uh, it has the same font menu as you've become accustomed to. Um, and it has these sort of superpower built into it, the ability to sort of move from one end of the spectrum of its design space to the other. So um, you might ask, why if um, why haven't we had access to, to all of these things all, the, all along? Like, why were we buying individual font files if essentially there was within these typefaces this sort of spectrum of design choices already? Um, why for if this existed for, for so long um have we been sort of locked in this idea that we needed to buy individual weights so there are some typefaces like this one that you're looking at which have had this variable font technology built into them for a long time this typeface that you're looking at here is called skia and it's designed by matthew carter um, and it's had variable as a capability for uh, in weight and width, so two axes, since 1994, which may be before some or all of you were born. <laughs> um, and despite the fact that it was created before you were born it and its variable, um, it is probably something that has existed on a computer that you've owned at some point in your life or have worked on. <clears throat> it's been lurking on every Macintosh computer for the last 26 or 27 years. Um, and this is a typeface called Jam, which is by this amazingly talented designer named Eric von Blocklin. And it's had variable capabilities since 1993. Um, it has a custom variable for bang. So that's the amount of pressure that's applied to it. It has an axis for crumble, which, um, yeah, I think is an allusion to typewriter ribbon. Um, it has spatter. So if you hit the key too hard, you get the little spatters around the letters. And it has an extra variable for punch, which fills in the, the, um, the letter forms at a certain point. Right now? When? <laughs> anyway, you'll see it fill in. And so that's the punch. So <clears throat> all of the tools for creating, um, for creating these typefaces like Skia and like Jam has existed for more than a quarter of a century. Um, but the tools for using um, variable fonts just weren't ready. So they just sort of sat there for a long time. Um, but that's sort of a chicken and egg explanation. Um, if all of these things existed and it took more than 25 years for them to catch on, then something must have changed very recently to make the fonts and the browsers and the design applications suddenly take on this idea of variable fonts. So what was it that changed? Well, the first thing is that we got type on the web, which again is something you may not have, you may not be aware of a time before there was type on the web, but there was a time when it was all default typefaces on the web. But now we have access to any typeface that we want to put on the web. Um, but there, the typefaces are a drag on the web. Um, they are another asset that needs to be downloaded, um, and nobody likes a slow web. So typefaces on the web are a drag. Um, but we all love fonts, uh, and hate slow web <laughs> and variable fonts are able to speed up the loading of web pages while miraculously providing access to millions or sometimes hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of new styles. So it, it is, as I pointed out at the top, a sort of miracle of the format that you would have more choice in a smaller footprint. Um, this is super important uh, in complex scripts like Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So this is M. Shong He He, which was designed by Adrian Ferdiger and Akira Kobayashi. Um, the variable version of this typeface provides access to the full range of Chinese glyphs in a full range of weights in a single font file, which if you're familiar with the <laughs> Chinese writing systems, traditional or, um, or simplified, it's a staggering achievement. Um, that's one font with hundreds of styles. Um, and Tazugani Info and Tazugani Gothic, which are designed by Akira Kobayashi, uh, Kazuhira Yamada and Ryota Doi, they do the same thing for Japanese, which is more choice in a smaller footprint. And Soul Sands, which was designed by Adrian Ferdiger and Akira Kobayashi and Minju Ham, does the same for Korean. So. The first thing is that traditional fonts are a drag on the web and variable fonts can speed up the web, which everybody loves. 
Uh, the second change that happened in the in recent uh, history is that the tools for making fonts um, got much better. <laughs> The tools are much better than they were in the 90s. Um, and each of these tools, Glyphs, um, Robofog, and FontLab, have all embraced the production of variable fonts. So the tools got better. Um, and the last thing is that everybody's on board. So Microsoft, Google, Apple, Adobe, and Monotype are all on board. And designers are on board too. Um, so I enjoyed designing variable fonts quite a bit because it is a sort of um, uh, an opportunity to conduct an orchestra as opposed to making an instrument. <laughs> um, it's uh, the ability to sort of watch a typeface across its development um, and to be concerned with what happens in the spaces in between. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, so everybody's in. Um, and you can see variable fonts in use today everywhere. This is a typeface called San Francisco, which if you have an a Apple Watch, it's on there. If you have an iPhone, it's on there. If you have a Macintosh computer, it's on there. Um, and it's a variable font that all of us use every day. And it's busy behind the scenes on our phones and watches and computers, changing the weight and the spacing and uh, optical size of typefaces so or of itself so that it appears crisp and professional no matter where you find it. Um, and new variable fonts are being released all the time. I mentioned Helvetica Now Variable, which was a sort of a rival point for variable. When the most popular typeface of all time be becomes a variable font, then you know the format has arrived. But Futura is also very popular. And Futura Now Variable um, was released by Monotype, I think, two, two, two years ago, yes. Um, and it contains a range of styles that weren't ever available to Futura users. So it's a completely new, um, a new way of thinking of an old family. Um, and when most people say they love typography, like, and everyone says that these days, I love type or I love typography or I love fonts. What they're usually referring to is this really large type, you know, display type, the really sort of charismatic type, um, the kind that's really sort of full of style, um, that's attention getting, that's emotive, refined. Um, but when I say I love typography, I think I'm, I'm in a smaller group of people who really love um, text typography. Um, and there's something really fun going on in variable type for, well, fun to people who love text typography. Um, for us people, variable type on the web, on phones, on tablets, on watches and in apps, um, it represents the sort of watershed moment of typographic possibility for refinement. Um, that we can automate some of that refinement through design intelligence and make the type responsive to the size in which it's used, to the um, instance in which it's used, to the reader who's reading it. Um, all of that will make a big difference for really tiny type, um, which is not a particularly appealing thing to people who are more concerned with the sort of charismatic aspect of type. But to type nerds like me, it's really important because it's about better communication through type. Um, but that's my, my little diatribe about text type versus display type onto more display type. Um, so movement um, or animation is not inherent in variable fonts, but it is the chief way of sort of showing the seamlessness of those variations, that it is a spectrum of type that moves from one end to the other. Um, most of the animations that I've shown you here so far, and the ones you're going to see in a second, are made using a standard web browser and a tiny bit of HTML and CSS. Um, because CSS is sort of in its latest incarnation has support for variable type, um, you can cycle through the variations within a typeface relatively easily, just a few lines of code. Um, so this is an anima animation of the, from the, well, it's an animation of a font with a single character <clears throat> that's based on, um, Edward Moybridge's uh, photographs of um, of horses galloping and humans running and people jumping. Um, and it comes from the Axis Praxis website, um, which is by Lawrence Penny. Um, and it sort of gets right to the point that variable fonts are fluid. So 
Um, this is where I think people are getting most excited about the sort of possibilities of variable fonts is the sort of parlor trick aspect, um, a creative tool for design exploration. So animation has come to characterize most showings and the sort of popular conception of variable fonts, um, not as individual instances, but as a spectrum, as a fluid movement from one, one end to the other. Um, so while I'm not concerned so much with the sort of charismatic aspects of variable fonts, they, um, they do represent to me a possible um, tool for creative expression. Oh, I'm just going to, I'll show you this next thing. This is, this is sort of what is possible um, as a result of, of people embracing variable as a creative tool. So this is a lo logo by the Monotype Studio, and it is part of the graphic identity for Amstel Dock, which is a business complex on the Amstel River in Amsterdam. And it uses the variable font format and basic animation to blur the boundaries between what a typeface is and what a logo type is, between what is a movie and a motion graphic and between a font and a movie. It's blurring a lot of, uh, a lot of lines. So the, the group VBAT uh, redesigned this Amstel Dock campus um, and converted it into a light-filled sort of business complex. So they really did an overhaul on the space. Um, Monotype conceived of the type design for the logo and for the space and the variable design space in which that logo would exist. So here's the typeface and it comes in condensed, regular, wide and ultra, but it also, of course, can move in between all of those styles. Um, so this is the sort of sketch of the design space in which this logo exists. And again, without the variable font format, you wouldn't be thinking of the sort of dimensionality or variability of a logo within a, a three-dimensional space. Um, but this defines the boundaries in which the logo is allowed to behave, uh, in which it can sort of move around and misbehave. It's sort of a, a framework for designers and the logo itself to explore. Um, and here you can see um, uh, Pedro Arria Cortez, who is a former studio mate of mine, exploring the ways in which that logo could respond to stimuli from its environment. So um, the, they looked at how the logo could change with the passing hours of the day or how it could respond to visitors as they walked by. And so Pedro here is experimenting with using hand gestures to change the axes, which you can see sort of moving left and right on the bottom right. Um, so it's crazy. Um, and of course, once it gets a workout, it has to rest. So this is its sort of standard breathing space. It sort of exists in its resting state, just sort of undulating like this. Um, so you can see the whole sort of deeper dive on this project on the Monotype website, and it's definitely worth checking out. Um, I, I can look it up for you and paste it in the chat later, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. And this is the part that I find is sort of the, the kind of unspoken about it, is the fact that the, the typeface and the logo can, um, can flex. It offers designers of static instances this sort of opportunity to explore a range of expressions all within the same family. So you get to places in design that you wouldn't get without variation as a design tool, um, which is very cool. Um, so let's go back to Moybridge again. <laughs> this is a sort of more difficult to understand conceptually um, version of a single character font. This is by, um, again, a former studio mate of mine, Toshi Amagari, and it is pretty crazy. So what Toshi did in this instance was to take all of the frames from this film um, and then create a font with the number of pixels equivalent to the number of pixels in the source, um, and then to provide layers <laughs> for each of the frames. Uh, it sort of, it hurts my head to, to, to explain to you what's going on, but essentially it's the same trick as, as any of the other examples in, in this um, deck that I'm showing you, that a couple of lines of HTML and CSS and this one character font then turns into a galloping horse. 
Um, and here he jumps ahead um, a few years to um, to Charlie Chaplin doing the sort of um, dinner roll dance. Um, yeah, so each pixel changes its size, which represents the tone. Um, and yeah, this is 38 years later. It's gone from Moybridge to Chaplin. And here's uh, 90 years more. This is Shaq and the cat. <laughs> um, so this is amazing. Um, this is a font, um, and this is a variable font. But you can see that baked into this, um, this idea of a spectrum of possibilities is an incredible um, creative possibilities. Things that um, people like Toshi and the Monotype Studio are beginning to explore, but, but we really haven't even tapped into the full extent of the creative possibilities of variables of font format. Um, I'm going to show you one, one more, a couple more things by Toshi. Um, so in this case, Toshi's using the same idea as before, but now he's using RGB subpixels. <laughs> um, and he's layered the three characters in this font on top of one another. So the R is red, um, the B is green, and the C is blue. Um, and then he just played the same trick as the last one, um, created a, a a pixel um, or a layer in the font equivalent to every pixel in the in the um, source video, and then um, a few lines of CSS, and it sort of animates it. Um, it's astounding. Um, so this is just three letters, um, A, B, and C, and a few lines of code, and suddenly you have a goldfish, or you have <laughs> this little ladybug jumping up. So it's kind of crazy um, uh, as a format for all of the sort of ordinary things that it can do, but also these sort of extraordinary things and the things we haven't even begun to see yet. Um, there are a few more examples on the Monotype website. So you can see the sort of um, the Sublime, the, the new Monotype um, typeface for M&Ms. But you can also see this crazy variable font that we designed for Every, which is a, um, a moving company in the UK, where um, variable was used to create 500 unique logos for each of the trucks in their fleet. Anyway, it's all incredibly exciting. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. But I'm going to go back through and sort of give you the, high, <laughs> the highlights in a very short explanation. So um, first, it's an entire family of type in a single font file. I think you got that by now. I've sort of hammered that point home. Um, if you purchase one variable font, you get thousands of fonts in the package. So they're priced sort of higher than, than the cost of a normal typeface, but they contain all of these possibilities. Um, this is a sort of, this is important to people who are programming websites and worried about download times but this is the sort of break-even point for, um, um, for average font sizes. So yeah, bigger, um, more styles, smaller, uh, smaller size. Um, the ability to, um, to refine type according to the optical axis, so to make type much more legible at small sizes and much more beautiful at large sizes. Um, and then just these creative possibilities that are, are still evolving. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced, and you probably are too, that this is the, the future of, of type. It's where type is going. Um, I think we all fell asleep in 2020 and woke up in 2022, and everything is animated now, and variable is playing a big part in that. Um, that's it. I'm going to stop for a second so I can see your faces, or at least see your, your screen pictures. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we can... We can talk. Nate, Diana. That was incredible. I look at this. I've got notes and notes and notes <laughs> and notes. Excellent. So I'm I am uh, learning today, and that was uh, that was awesome. And so yeah, we have Nate. Are you there, Nate? Yes, oh, yeah. I am here. Hello, hi. hi. All right. So Nate is here helping me out today, and we're going to kind of, um, if it's okay with you, Charles, spend a couple of minutes going back and forth and asking some questions. If anyone else in the class has questions that you have that you thought about when um, when Charles was doing his presentation, or you have now, by all means, throw them in the chat, and we'll try and make sure that we we get to them. So Nate, go for it. Any questions for Charles? 
Yeah, I do. First of all, I just want to say amazing presentation. I had no idea just how far type and type technology has evolved. And it's so fascinating. And I'm not, I'm not sure if Diana told you this, but we're currently in the process of creating our own custom typefaces. And I'm not, I'm not sure about everyone else, but at least for me, creating just even a simple display typeface is already for, for me like a massive undertaking. And to realize that there's this whole world out there of typefaces and just hearing all these big numbers, like 850 variations within or 76,000, it's incredible. And so I just, I just want to ask like, where, where would one start if they wanted to create a variable typeface? Like even just with, let's say the first two axes, uh, variable axes, like weight and width, like would you start at the most hairline variation and then work your way up towards the, the boldest variation? Or would you start like at the regular and then work sort of left and right? Like it's, there, yeah. it just seems like such a big process. That's a good question. Um, every typeface, every variable typeface has to have a sort of a core style, like there has to be a normal. Um, so our process when we're designing, like we're designing a typeface right now as a studio for a large news organization. And our process always begins with key letters in the normal weight. Um, and we choose a word like adhesion or hamburger fonts, like something that sort of shows a lot of um, variations, um, but and looks like the entire font is designed, even though it's only like, you know, a handful of letters. Um, but from those handful of letters, we can, we can set enough dummy copy to sort of get an idea of the look and feel. But we always start with that regular weight because it's the core um, and everything in a variable font varies off of that core. So the way that variable fonts work and why they're so much smaller than all of the styles just sort of crammed into a zip is that... Um, is that that core style is the, the, the rudiment and then everything else is sort of calculated as a degree of change off of that. So that core style must exist. And then the lighter weight is just a, um, it's a degree of change as opposed to a completely separate drawing, which I don't know if that makes sense, but they, we call them deltas. Um, and delta is just the representation of the degree of change. So. Um, as it gets thicker, the delta the delta moves, and it's just storing the the um, it's storing the possible changes as opposed to the drawings themselves. Now, when we design the typefaces, we still have to draw those extremes, but we start with that core, and then go. We figure out how extreme we want to go. We usually, when we're designing typefaces in the Monotype Studio, we usually drive past where we would want them to be. So we make a very very thin. Um, and a very, very thick, and then tend to dial it back a little bit. But we want to have the flexibility to find out how light we want to make it. Um, when we released Helvetica Now, we designed, um, we designed a very, very light version of it and a very, very heavy version of it. And when we initial, initially released the typeface, we didn't include those weights. But in the variable type, you can get to that design space that doesn't exist in the static. So anyway, it's kind of like an Easter egg for people who <laughs> have the variable version. But yeah, always start in the middle. Variable as a path to, yeah, as you said, the Easter egg to get to something that you can't normally get to. I like that. Now, now I have a question for you, Charles, in regards to kind of the monetization or pricing structure. So you mentioned buy one, get a thousand free, and I love a good deal. But <laughs> I want to know, like, is this changing the the way that fonts are priced in the marketplace or what what effect do you think that will bring well at the at the present um we release both simultaneously so when we released helvetica now variable we released a whole bunch of static um, versions of the compressed and condensed end of the spectrum because when we had a couple of years prior released the initial version of Helvetica now it didn't have compressed and condensed because um, they sell less than the the sort of normal normal widths um, but we knew we wanted to include it in the variable so we we released static weights to a company that previously released static weights so that anyone who wants to just buy the ultra light can buy the ultra light and it costs very little money. I mean, in the scheme of things, I know everyone's price conscious, but 
uh, $20 for a typeface is a huge bargain considering the amount of um, time and effort that goes into creating a typeface. Um, but you're right. We do price at monotype. And I think on my fonts, um, they're priced at slightly less than the entire family. So they're really aimed at people who are going to buy the entire family anyways. So if you were going to buy Helvetica now, when it was first released, I think it was, it was ridiculously inexpensive for an entire family of type. It was like $99 and you got everything. Um, if you were going to spend that, then buying the variable makes complete sense because you're, you get all of those typefaces plus all of the spaces in between. Um, but it is going to cost more than, than, you know, the $20 that most people are used to paying for a single weight of a typeface. That said, um, the world is moving to streaming and typefaces are no different. So soon you won't even be thinking about whether you're buying fonts as software, you'll be streaming the font and you'll be paying for usage as opposed to, um, as, a pay, as opposed to ownership of a license to use a piece of font software. <laughs> That's a bit of, um, I sort of let that go really quickly, but nobody owns the font software. We still own it. I mean, I own, I own the ones that I create. Monotype owns the ones that they create. All the foundries own theirs. What we do is sell licenses to use that software. Um, and I know I'm not in just fall off the apple cart. I know that um, everyone on this call has a font on their computer that they didn't pay for. <laughs> I know it because I was one of those people. Um, that said, um, it's just like any other piece of software um, or it's like um, like stock photography or stock music. You know, you pay for the use of it. Right, absolutely. Thank you. That was a great, great answer. <laughs> The long-winded answer. Sorry. No, it's good. It makes sense. It's kind of like <laughs> eBooks too. I was thinking, like you, the, I know there was a bit of an uproar in the publishing world, or when when people realized they could go and buy a printed copy of a book and they own that, it sits on their shelf and they can forever pass it down to their children if they wish. But mm -hmm. in terms of an eBook, you're buying the license to that digital copy, and theoretically, the company can go zoop and it can no longer exist on your device. So it's kind of a similar, um, not that, yeah, I guess fonts don't exist in quite the same way, but. Well, um, I mean, there are instances, so, um, and this shouldn't strike the fear of fear of the font police into everyone, but um, we do keep track of the licenses that we sell to people or, um, and when people violate those licenses, which happens, we can revoke the license. Um, and we do. <laughs> You know, if somebody says they're going to use it on one computer and then they install it on every computer in their organization or give it to all of their friends, um, we can revoke the license. And if you're using it unlicensed, then that's a very different thing than using it under licensed. So it's, you know, it's not to not to, again, to act as a threat, but just to sort of say, this is the this is the agreement that you enter into when you purchase a typeface. It's not the typeface itself, but the license to the to the usage of it. Do yeah, we need no. special software to create variable type? Um, to create variable type, you do. You'll need something like Glyphs or Font Lab or Robofog. Um, I would use Glyphs just because it's the easiest. Um, then um, you can test it in font software like Illustrator, InDesign, and Photoshop, Figma, Sketch. They all support variable type. Sorry, I'm reading off of the chat. <laughs> Do you often find yourself using your own typefaces? Well, I would be a bad dentist if I didn't um, brush my teeth. Um, I My favorite typeface is always the last one I worked on. So yeah, I definitely tend to want to kick the tires and drive them around the track as many times as possible until I create another one. Not to mix metaphors. <laughs> yeah, I'm most excited. I think the thing I'm most excited about with variable type is what hasn't happened yet. Because it's just like something incredibly explosive has been introduced into the into a otherwise very sort of quiet, hardworking, sort of nose down um, discipline and it has the potential to completely change the way that we think about 
what type is. Um, and we are working with some agencies and some brands right now who sort of get that. We're like, oh, there's a room, there's room here to experiment. And I, I mean, all of you, everybody on this call, <laughs> me, myself included, these things don't happen all the time. I know we think that our lives are going to be full of these instances where like where um, something technologically exciting is visited upon us, but it is a lot of, it's sort of like pe pe all the descriptions of war, like incredibly, um, incredibly violent chaos followed by lots of sitting around waiting for things to happen. <laughs> and that's what's, we're in the midst of something incredibly, um, incredibly revolutionary. Um, and these things just don't happen that often. So there are some visionary brands out there who are like, we get it. We want to create a new identity that embraces this new font format and gives us the difference. Like, and being different is, it's it's everything so there are many different ways to be different with variable but to me that's the most exciting part of it is like wow something new came yeah. along no i think i think it's really interesting especially especially in this day and age where we have just seen such a creative like explosion just in creativity in general um like i remember reading an article where they said that they like we're moving towards a very creative economy uh but I also really liked how you talked about how a lot of us, because just from speaking with my own colleagues and myself, a lot of people have this fascination with display typefaces because of how creative and artistic they can get. But after this presentation and just taking the LinkedIn learning course that you have, that, that you uh, have, which by the way, has been so helpful for me and I'm pretty sure for many others in this course, uh, it's been, it's so amazing to see the technology that help in type design that helps with legibility and readability. And I definitely agree. I'm super interested at how variable fonts can be used to develop typefaces that can work at these optical sizes. Uh, yeah, and I just, I, I wanna ask like when it comes to optical sizing, is there like a set, like these specific sizes are what you wanna aim for or, uh, like, are there standards or it's pretty much like free game in terms of determining which sizes would work best with your typeface? So there are a couple, couple of sort of ways to approach answering, answering that. So w one is that um, the CSS, um, the CSS format or the latest version of CSS, um, the one that, that is employed by every browser that we could use with the exception of like some wacky backwards, i.e. Internet Explorer browsers, but everything that we use, Chrome, um, Safari, um, the latest versions of, um, of Microsoft browsers, they all use the latest version of CSS. And that version of CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, automatically employs optical sizes if it senses that they're there. So if you set 10 point type um, in CSS, and the optical size exists for 10 point, it will use that 10 point. You have to turn it off. So it's sort of automatically going to incorporate optical sizing. Similarly, um, you can opt in to using optical sizing in InDesign at this point. So again, if the, if the variable type that you're using has the optical sizes available, you can turn it on so that six point type becomes six point type and 72 point type becomes 72 point type. So that said, when we design, it's the same as like how light is light and how dark is dark. Like you can decide you're going to go from six point to 30 point and that everything beyond 30 point will use that 30 point master. Or you can go like we did in, in Wallbaum and go way above that to 96 point. And the reason I did that for, for Wallbaum was that I had done I, uh, research of Wallbaum's original designs and found that he had worked at his largest, you know, 100 and, 126 point or 128 point. And so we wanted to, to recreate that sort of largest scale um, Wallbaum drawing. And he also did six point. So we had the full spectrum um, and the ability to sort of move through in steps through that. Um, and same thing with Helvetica. Like 
six point designs for Helvetica when it was released in the in the late fifties were very different than the the seventy two point um, typefaces. So we wanted to reintroduce the that sort of level of finesse to the typeface. Um, so I'd say the the small end of the spectrum, like a a five point or a six point master, is really important, and the large large in Helvetica, we go up to a 30 point master and then everything beyond that is, is gravy. We expect, I think that if somebody's using Helvetica at 72 point, that they're going to be custom kerning it, um, that you're, you're going to anything that we build into the optical size, you're going to override anyways, because we're all finicky typographers and it will never be right, but we can, we can get it to that 30 point and have it look really beautiful, really refined. Um, and down at six point, really rugged. Now, the third answer to this <laughs> to this question is, what happens to a six point type and what happens to a 72 point type? How are they different than the 12 point type? So most everything that we've been using for the past 30 years in typography, digital typography has been designed on a 10 or a 12 point master. That is, it's a typeface like Helvetica, Neue Helvetica, was designed based on the 12 point drawing for that typeface. So when you blew it up, it looked like a small typeface that had been made large. The spacing was really wide um, and the forms were kind of intensely rugged. So you get like blunt edges on the end of that, um, that trailing serif on the, on the A um, or the capital R, the leg comes down. There's a little um, chamfer on it. That's a, typical sort of uh, 12 point move where you don't want it to be super sharp because it's a 12 point. But those extremes are the things that are really interesting in terms of increasing legibility for really small sizes and increasing the sort of beauty of something for really large sizes. Let's start with the small size first. So at six point, you want to increase the letter spacing. So the space around the letters has to get much wider than you would think is, is sort of... Um, is sort of necessary or good. Um, and the way that you figure out how much is experimentation, like you have to look at it. Um, in the case of Helvetica, we had some sort of uh, metal type examples that gave us a clear idea of what the original designers, Max Meetinger and um, Edward Hoffman thought was the right amount of side bearing for the letters to have. So we just sort of started with that, but then increased it even more. So increasing the letter spacing is one thing. Uh, reducing the contrast. So in a typeface like Helvetica, um, the contrast between thick and thin is minimal, um, but it's still there. So the horizontal strokes are thinner than the vertical strokes. The contrast in a six-point master gets much reduced. So the, th the thins get thicker and the thicks get slightly thinner. I mean, in, in all in all, it becomes more mono weight. Um, so those are two things. Um, overall spacing, um, the contrast between thick and thin, any apertures, which are those sort of moments when light enters the inside of the letter form or gets trapped, like on the lowercase c, where the down um, the inside of the letter form gets mixed with the outside. Those apertures um, in a typeface like Helvetica are very closed. But as you, as you get down to the six point, they need to open up. So um, we open up apertures and again, that's just to disambiguate forms so that an O doesn't end up looking like an E and a C doesn't end up looking like an O and an E. Um, so disambiguation through more open apertures. Then um, one of the last things, there are many other things, but um, the, the sort of one of the last big things is that the counter shapes themselves get larger. So you open up the, the I on the E. Um, you open up the the top of the capital R so that it just has a bigger counter space inside of it. All of the counter spaces get, get bigger. And as a result, the letter forms get slightly wider. So in addition to all the letter spacing you put around them, the letter forms themselves get wider. What happens on the other end of the spectrum is the exact opposite. The spacing gets tighter. You worry much more about the kerning between letters because um, everything's close up ready. It's kind of the difference between makeup for the stage versus makeup for the cover of a magazine. Like on the cover of a magazine, every eyelash is going to be seen. But from the stage, the person in the first row is still far away from the, from the actor. And so everything's super exaggerated. 
So the stage makeup is the six point, and then the the cover girl makeup is the um, is the uh, seventy two point. So we wor worry more about kerning. The for lack of a better term, the 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 forms get more sinuous. So um, we tend to um, look at the way that curves flow a lot more carefully in the larger things, and then um, yeah, tighter spacing. Uh, there tends to be either a larger or a smaller X height. So we do fuss with the X height, depending on what the typeface looked like in its original form. Um, and then, yeah, lots of other sort of a myriad of small adjustments that get made that just add up to something that looks much better at larger sizes. So sorry, long answer again. <laughs> No, so good. So good. I love that analogy of the stage makeup and then the the magazine or the cover shoot makeup. I think that to me kind of solidifies, oh yeah, that's the why behind this or that's kind of the, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I, I mean, most people will just, when they're setting small type, will just make the type smaller. Um, and you can't set eight point type the same as 12 point type. And the analogy that I give there is similar to the stage makeup thing. Like if there are a crowd of people on a hill a mile away and they're all right next to one another, it will be very difficult for you to count them because they'll just look like a clump of people. There might be 10, there might be 12. But if they all stood with three feet between them, you could count them relatively easily, even from a mile away. Um, and that's why, why we space smaller type um, much wider than than text type or display type, because as it gets smaller, you need that extra breath in order to disambiguate between those forms and to add up to, to legibility. Um, and when we design type, we, we sort of incorporate that into the optical size. Well, thank you so much, Charles, for your time and your wisdom and your energy and your enthusiasm and all <laughs> things uh, type. And uh, I don't know, if, did you want to mention something about the building brands with oh. type? I just put, uh, it was fresh on my mind because it's about to go out on um, monotype social media. Um, the, the summer, there is a um, branding with type course, which is essentially a glorified type design course with some really great, um, uh, great teachers and me. Um, and it's four weeks. It's in New York City. Um, it's not inexpensive, but um, it's, uh, it's, as I think Matteo put it, um, it's, Summer camp for type nerds. <laughs> anyway, um, definitely worth at least checking out. Um, but yeah, I uh, pasted it in here just so that you were aware of it. That's wonderful. I want to go. Can anyone watch my kids? Anyone in this room <laughs> want? <laughs> you can have my children uh, for the month of July. Anyone? Anyone? No. Okay. No takers. Well, thank you so much, Charles, for again your your um, your very generous time and and energy today. And it's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure too.